In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you for this time to come together. Thank you for the writings of St. John Paul II that you've uh, given to the church for us to unpack and to think about and to apply to our lives. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit and your help in this. Help us to understand, because it is difficult at times, but help us to understand the meaning of being a body, the meaning of being male and female created in your image. Help us to understand so that we can then serve others and help others as well. Um, and we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John Paul II. Pray for us. Pray. St. Joseph. Pray for us. We dedicate this evening to our Blessed Lady, Hail Mary, full of grace. Full of grace. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, guys, we are almost to the end of part one. Um, we just have audience number 85. And then uh, this is our last one on the topic of celibacy. We've been reflecting first on Jesus's words on celibacy in Matthew chapter 19, and now St. Paul's words on celibacy in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, so this will wrap up our, our discussion of celibacy. And then um, on Friday, we'll have audience number 86, which is titled The Redemption of the Body. And that's the last one of, of part one. Um, and then we go to audience number 87, which is the beginning of part two of theology of the body so theology of the body is two parts part one which is an anthropology an adequate anthropology based on the three words of christ we've looked at the triptych christ appeals to the beginning christ appeals to the human heart in the sermon on the mount to our history which includes the redemption of christ and the hope of the everyday as he says the call to holiness that is possible um and then the word of Christ when he appeals to the resurrection of the body. So this is our origin, our history, and our destiny. It's kind of like the story of salvation. The story, the, it's, a, it's a worldview. It's a way to understand the world, how God created us good in the beginning, to see God's original plan, to see how we fell and how Christ redeemed us, how God sent his son Jesus to save us and to call us to something better than even it was in the beginning to call us to heaven, which is the fulfillment of all our desires um, and more than beyond what I can see it in ear as heard and it's beyond what we've even thought about, that's what heaven will be. So we've, we've, gone, we've gone there with St. John Paul II who, who bases himself totally on scripture. This is, this is a lot different. I'm also going through love and responsibility right now. This is a lot different than love and responsibility because that work by Carol Wojtyla is based primarily on philosophy and psychology. He builds his argument not so much off of scripture as he does here. He includes a few moments of scripture in the other one, but theology of the body is saturated with scripture. It's really biblically, biblically based. It's based on the word of God, the revelation of the body. What does, what does the Bible, what does God say in his word about the meaning of being a body, about the meaning of being made male and female in his image. Um, and so we're looking at various passages through our study. When we get to part two, we're gonna focus primarily on the sacramentality of marriage. How is marriage a sacrament? To say it's one of the seven sacraments of the church. What does this mean? What does, what does this entail for marriage? And we're basing that off of Ephesians chapter five. Um, so that, that'll be our main text there. Um, and then we will end up uh, focusing, well, in, in uh, chapter five, we're going to look at the Song of Songs and the Book of Tobit as well uh, as two other scripture references. And then the very last chapter, it was chapter six, is really a reflection on Humanae Vitae, which is a document encyclical by Pope Paul VI, which confirmed the church's teaching on contraception. And John Paul II will tie the whole thing together, the whole theology of the body together to see, to show how 
it's an argument, it's a foundation, it's a structure for understanding humanae vitae, for, for understanding the church's teaching on marriage and procreation. But we've seen that theology of the body entails so much. It's really about what does it mean to be human? Um, and so we are finishing up part one. So let's go ahead and dive into audience number 85. Although the apostle, so Paul, way of expressing himself here is not without difficulty, we can still agree that what lies at the basis of the Pauline interpretation of the subject of marriage and virginity is not so much the metaphysics of accidental, that is fleeting being, but rather of the theology of a great expectation whose fervent spokesman Paul was. <laughs> Not the world is man's eternal destiny, but the kingdom of God. So in this first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 7, Paul talks about the world is passing away. That this world is passing away. And John Paul II just notes that Paul is not saying here that he he's, he's not talking about being, this metaphysical being of that is just fleeting, it's just passing away. But Paul is writing about the world passing away because of a theology of a great expectation of the return of Christ, of the fulfillment of the world. So this is Paul's motivation for writing this. And it's primarily saying the world is not our eternal destiny, but the kingdom of God. Um, so we're in the world, we're called to build the kingdom while here on earth, we're, we're living in the kingdom, but not yet fully realized. As, it were, we're, as Catholics, we often say already, but not yet. So uh, we're building the kingdom here on earth, and we're still waiting for its fulfillment and completion. So marriage, St. Paul says in this text, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, is also tied to the stage of this world. And he says things like, those who have wives should act as not having them, those who use the world as not using the world, things like that. Um, so marriage is also tied to this world, which is passing. And here we are some way quite close to the perspective Christ opened in his statement about the future resurrection. So in, in Christ's statement, which we saw, which we analyzed in chapter three, um, he appeals to the future resurrection and, and where they will not be given a uh, husband and wife in heaven. So this virginity in heaven, uh, as it will be in heaven where marriage will no longer exist. Um, this is similar to St. Paul's, what he's saying here about marriage as being a part of this world that's passing away. So through what we discover in a clear sighted reading of 1 Corinthians, especially chapter seven, we discover the whole real realism of the Pauline theology of the body. So what does Paul say about the theology of the body? Um, while the apostle proclaims in the letter that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. So this is a key phrase. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within us. In this temple, the fact that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, we live this reality in either vocation that we choose, either marriage or celibacy. The person who's living in marriage or celibacy is living uh, as a temple of the Holy Spirit. He is at the same time fully aware of the weakness and sinfulness to which man is subject precisely by reason of the concupiscence of the flesh. So it's like we have this glory, we have the glory of being a temple of the Holy Spirit, being baptized, being an adopted son and daughter of Christ, you know, receiving God in the Eucharist, you know, all these gifts in, in a weak fallen nature. So we still have the concupiscence, which is a tendency to sin, not a sin in itself, but as a result of original sin, as we've looked at earlier in the theology of the body, we have this concupiscence of the flesh, while at the same time being um, a temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so in, in these texts of St. Paul, 
we do not find any foundation for considering those who live in marriage carnal and those by contrast who religious reasons choose content spiritual. So it's not fair to say that those who choose marriage are not spiritual. We can't say that um, because those who choose marriage are called to be spiritual. They're called to receive the Holy Spirit. They are also a temple of the Holy Spirit, um, just like those who choose continence. In fact, in one as well as the other way of living, today we would say, in one as well as the other vocation, the gift is at work that each one receives from God. That is grace. So this term gift comes from St. Paul. He says that one has one gift and one has another gift. And this is referring to vocation, that a vocation is actually a gift. And another way, another way of saying gift is grace, that it's a grace, uh, which brings it about that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And this body remains a temple of the Holy Spirit in virginity or continence, as well as in marriage. If one remains faithful to his own gift, so to your own vocation that God has given you as a gift, and in conformity with this state or vocation, does not dishonor the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is his body. Okay, this is also from chapter seven. This is just a further text that John Paul II reflects on a little bit here at the end. Um, also found in this same chapter, this other words from St. Paul. He says to the married couple, do not abstain from each other except by common agreement for a set time to devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you through lack of self-control. This is to say, by way of concession, not of command. So John Paul II notes that he says this by way of concession and not command, that um, often St. Paul has said that, you know, he's very clear earlier in this text that he says, this is my advice to you is not a command of the Lord. He's very clear about when, he, when he's saying something that's a command of God, versus his own counsel, versus a counsel. And Jesus was also saying that about continence, that it's not a command, but it's a counsel or an invitation. It's an invitation to some, but it's not a, a command. Okay, and then at the very end of this audience, um, there were a couple of pretty big, quotes that were kind of awesome. So I put it them. Um, these two dimensions of the human vocation are not opposed to each other, but complementary. So marriage and celibacy, these two dimensions of the human vocation, uh, two ways of being called to live out the spousal meaning of our bodies, to make a gift of ourselves, are not opposed to each other. Marriage and celibacy are not opposed to each other, but are complementary. Both provide a full answer to man's underlying questions. So they both provide this answer. They both provide the full answer to our questions, namely the question about the meaning of being a body. What does it mean to be a body? That I am a body, like I have a body, I am this body. What does this mean? That is the meaning of masculinity and femininity of being in the body, a man or a woman. So these are fundamental questions that every person must ask and seek the answer to because we are all, all human. We are body and soul unity. Um, and so both vocations are uh, the, the answer to this meaning of being a body. We can live out the meaning of our bodies in either marriage or in celibacy for the kingdom. Um, yeah. So what we have customarily defined, customarily throughout this whole catechesis as theology of the body. So this is what we've defined. Theology of the body proves to be something truly fundamental and constitutive for anthropological hermeneutics as a whole. So that's the study of what it means to be human. This theology of the body is fundamental for what it means to be human, anthropology. 
So there's a lot of people in the secular world who study anthropology, um, who do anthropology, but they might study anthropology in a little different way than we're speaking of here, because we're bringing in the text of scripture. What does scripture say about the meaning of being human? Um, so this is, this is anthropology that we're doing. And at the same time, equally fundamental for ethics and for the theology of human ethos. So this is huge. This is a huge statement that the theology of the body is fundamental for anthropology and ethics. These are huge things, uh, topics of philosophy, of theology. So this means theology of the body is pretty important that these topics we're discussing, um, what does it mean to be a body? This is, this is pretty important for anthropology and for ethics. It says it's fundamental. Um, and for the theology of human ethos. Okay, so there's a couple of retreats coming up or three day long retreats, one in Pittsburgh at the end of May, early June, one in Mexico City, June 10th through 12th, uh, to visit Our Lady of Guadalupe and have an awesome time. You're all invited. Uh, we pray the rosary every night at 9 p.m. It's a growing community where if you've ever been to the TOB Institute, you know that uh, these courses that are taught there go hand in hand with prayer. That is that the study of theology of the body and the study of theology in general, as um, as several saints have said, and as Cardinal Schoenborn in Austria said uh, to our school that he was the, the president of, um, that theology must be done on one's knees. Theology must be done on one's knees, that we cannot study God without having a relationship with him. That is not enough to know head knowledge about God, but we must know him. We must know him at, in a personal relationship. And I've also heard uh, from one of you, I think, that it's important to know the spirituality of John Paul II, to enter into the spirituality of, of St. John Paul II in order to fully understand him. Um, so please come and pray with us. Prayer goes hand in hand with this study. Um, and we also pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet at 3 p.m. Central Time. And finally, if you'd like to support this work, you can um, by prayer, by uh, praying for anybody going through the theology of the body or financially, you can support me. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Alrighty, so audience number 85. Um, this is our last one on the topic of celibacy, so We've, we've made it through, there are quite a lot of audiences, but um, what, what are your thoughts or reactions or feedback or question? I have a question. In the third part, it said, wife is bound the whole time husband is alive. Um, and if he dies, then she can marry anyone, but is this St. Paul writing? Okay, so he suggests remaining a widow. Um, I never heard that before, that whole thing. I never did. Oh, like, did Jesus say this ever? Mm. Or did John Paul II say this ever? That a wife is found the whole time her husband is alive um and if and only if he dies 
then she can remarry. Well, Jesus kind of said that too, that first part, because he said about divorce, that divorce is not possible, that what God has joined together, man must not put asunder. Um, and that he who, he who marries a married person commits adultery. Like Jesus said that. Um, and that's why in the church, we don't have divorce, but we have annulments, which basically says a marriage never existed in the first place. Um, this is way different than our, our secular world, right? Than our, so we have to understand in terms of how, what Jesus taught, what is the true meaning of marriage um, and how really when, when it's a sacramental marriage, really the two are no longer two, but they're one. They're really one. And what God has joined together, they can't be. So that's why a wife is bound to her husband as long as they're alive. And um, only if one dies, then they're free to marry or to go. But, and then St. Paul, this is St. Paul that he recommends his counsel is that she stay a single celibate for the kingdom. Yeah. A widow. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah. Yes, I understand Sarah's question because I think I, I was having the same. I was wondering, and I want to be truthful. I don't quite understand why all these audiences we have read over and over how John Pope Paul II explains us how marriage is important, how it's a sign of God's love, how it makes us grow. And then in this part, he keeps uh, talking about St. Paul and St. Paul advising that it's better not to get married. I find it a little bit contradictory. Does anybody have the same feeling or I'm not understanding something? No, no, that's me exactly. Yeah. So Nick, answer. <laughs> <laughs> or anyone else can give it a shot. <laughs> I, think, I think what John Paul II is doing is going through the scripture text. So we, we're starting, we're looking at what does St. Paul say in 1 Corinthians 7. And this is another thing that he says. So he St. John Paul II is not ignoring any scripture, right? He's bringing it all together. And St. Paul says this. And so this is on the topic of, so this is on our topic. So we have to bring it up. You can't, you can't ignore what St. Paul says, right? I mean, um, so we, yeah, it's just another scripture text that is a part of this theology of the body. It's a part of this discussion of marriage and celibacy. Nick, I, I think though what, what John Paul doesn't do for me is put some of what St. Paul said into context. At the beginning of this audience is where Paul says, in essence, marriage is the old way. The world is coming to an end. Jesus will return soon. The whole idea of procreation makes no sense. You need to be continent for the kingdom now, not married, whether you're a widow or anybody else, because it's almost over. The idea of procreating makes no sense now that Jesus is about to return. There are those today who argue the same thing don't have children and bring them into this unholy world. And, and that's kind of sad because that in essence takes away from marriage just at a time that we need to be building up marriage from all three points, procreation, mutual enrichment and remedy for concupiscence. But Paul kind of dashes that right at the beginning of this audience. So is, it, is your issue with St. Paul? Well, Right now, my issue is which I'm, I have an issue with both, but at mm -hmm. least Paul, Saint, the Apostle Paul, uh, the writer Paul was writing in the context of his time where everybody believed and he believed that the end of the world was imminent soon within our lifetime. That's what he told people. Mm -hmm. St. John Paul, 2000 years later, 
doesn't mention that fact that this this one argument against procreation, you know, we've had 2000 so years of that and it doesn't make that much sense or put it into context. That's my only point. I want to respond to both what Sarah and Delia said and uh, what Nick said. Uh, so Nick Grant, I've heard that point from scholars that St. Paul thought the end of the world was happening in like less than a year or so. Um, and it seems to me like a theory and it's a good theory, but I'm not convinced of it um, because there's other things he says that don't seem to indicate that to me. Um, and in my mind, his argument here in 1 Corinthians 7 um, is best summed up by that statement in 738 that the one who marries the betrothed does well, but he who refrains from marriage will do better. So St. Paul is still saying, like, you can marry, and that's a good thing. Um, but celibacy for the kingdom is a better thing. And that's my understanding of where he's coming from when he's advising widows not to remarry. Um, and I suspect that as a pastor, he's not thinking about, like, a woman who has young children. I suspect he's thinking of a woman whose children are either grown up or maybe um, even her husband died before she was able to have children. Um, if he didn't say that, then obviously like all of us would be like, what are you talking about? You know, like that a woman in that society definitely needs the support of a husband. Um, I suspect there was a lot of support from the family unit then, um, you know, like cousins who live nearby and sisters, brothers. Um, but his statement makes sense to me. If marriage is good, but celibacy is better, um, and you've already married once, um, it's better to be celibate. And also, this might be just my interpretation throwing it in there, but I wonder if St. Paul is thinking that marriage represents our spiritual marriage to the Lord through the church that the church is the body of Christ. And so one marriage indicates, you know, this one union with Christ and a second marriage kind of breaks that metaphor. Maybe he's not thinking that, but that went through my mind. Very thorough answer. Um, I don't have anything to offer like that. I, I just noticed it though that um, in, e in, in almost every one of the sections, John Paul makes a reference to um, something that would indicate the good of marriage. So he says the one thing, uh, as you've all mentioned, but I, I had several highlights where, for instance, in number four, um, the second paragraph, he says, but nevertheless, we do not find any foundation for considering those who live in marriage carnal and those, by contrast, for religious reasons, who are continent spiritual. He goes on to the next section. Uh, at the same time, grace, that is, one's own gift of God, helps also spouses in the shared life. They are so closely united, they become one flesh. This shared carnal life is a subject to the power of their own gift from God, in quotation marks. And, and there's many other uh, of these. So <clears throat> it occurs to me, this is a mystery. People have spoken about this is a great mystery. Uh, just the fact that the marriage is a great mystery. And the marriage of Christ and the church is a great mystery. So um, it's kind of hard to talk about this subject without us coming from our own perspective, hearing things that would indicate, wow, that doesn't seem congruent, or that doesn't seem to fit, uh, because this is, this is a mystery, and this is a challenging mystery. And so I would say to you that 
Yes, he says several times what you guys referenced, but he also says several times about it's your own gift and that the emphasis is on pleasing the Lord, which doesn't necessarily mean being continent. Pleasing the Lord is a higher good than anything else. <laughs> so um, just, just putting that out there. If we go to chapter 7 of uh, 1 Corinthians, verse 6, maybe how he speaks of con concession versus command might give us some insight here. And so a concession is, I think, is per more his personal opinion Whereas the command would be more of something that he would consider a uh, um, truth, I think. He even speaks of he wished that all were as I myself am. So it, it sounds like he's talking about a preference. So it. I think in, in his own own words, he's he's trying to say that uh, this this is something that I, I suggest, but you know, it's only a suggestion. And in the context of Scripture, I don't think we have to take it as a uh, something that we would build a uh, theology on. And if you continue that verse, uh, Ed. My, my translation says, but right after that, I wish they were as I myself am, but each has his own special gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Now, this is the same Paul, right, who talks about the body and talks about the head and the hand and the ears and the nose. And, and he makes a special point about that, doesn't he? He says, yeah ridiculous right for the feet to say to the head i don't need you you know for the head to say to the hands i don't need you this would be ridiculous and make no sense so um it occurs that that's you know part of this this point here that there is going to be a difference in how you live out your vocation. Look, Bob, that's a good point. And I've got a question for you and Nick Grant and everyone else. Um, do you guys think that St. Paul uses a little bit more hyperbole when he talks to the Corinthians than he does to anybody else. Like that's just his communication style with this group of people. Um, cause, cause he says a lot of things here where it's, um, you know, like big and like, this is the way it needs to be. But I understand that God's plan is bigger than that. Sort of like a little bit later on, he's like, you know, Hey, I talk in tongues more than any of you. And I wish you were all like me. But each has his own gift. Really good point. Um, I, I'm not sure I know scripture well enough um, to know that, but you can definitely see that in this in this you know Corinthians letter. You can definitely see that tendency. And I would add that. If you look at Paul's letters, a number of which have to deal with this mounting feeling from the churches of when will Christ return? When will the Redeemer return? You, you know, in, in some scripture, even Jesus said it will be within the lifetime of the 12. 
it will be within a generation. So Paul is getting hit with those questions and he answers them a little differently depending on the church. You know, if the, if the church that's asking the question, if there's sort of this upheaval of those who have seen their relatives die before the return of Jesus, then he is, he, he d discusses that differently than, than when he just discusses the, the end of the world and the parousia. So I would argue, yes, he speaks to audiences and speaks a little differently, but there are some themes that are his in really all of his letters. Anyway, that's just a thought. Nick, I thought you were going to say um, the way he talks about it depends on how well behaved they are. <laughs> if they're well, the Corinthians, go ahead. Yeah, and, and that's speaking to your audience. <laughs> Just speaking of so many different texts of St. Paul, um, we are having a love and responsibility discussion this morning. And in one of the, the verses, we were talking about shame and sexual shame. And this topic comes up earlier in uh, Theology of the Body, um, the entrance of shame that, you know, because they were naked without shame before the fall and then the fall. And then they, that's, that's the entrance of shame into the human condition. Um, and so in Love and Responsibility, John Paul II reflects on sexual shame, of having shame uh, for certain body parts and things like that. And we talked about modesty, um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a quote from St. Paul that he speaks about the body and how some, some members of the body are more presentable than others. And the less presentable parts we hold with higher honor we hold with higher honor and dignity. Um, and th this is just a text of St. Paul um, that he's making a point with using the human body as he also makes a point with using the human body to speak of the church, the body of Christ, how we're all different members. Like Bob, you mentioned that, that other text from St. Paul using the human body. And so these are all significant, significant texts for the theology of the body. Um, because we're looking at what does scripture say about the human body. And so St. Paul has a lot to say. And, and in this audience, John Paul II calls it the Pauline theology of the body. Um, yeah, so I just want to say that. And we're, go we're going next time to another text of the author to the Ephesians. Is it St. Paul? I'm not a scripture scholar, but some people just say the author of Ephesians. I'm assuming it's St. Paul, but I don't, I don't do that research. But um, the author to the Ephesians writes about marriage. And so this is another key text of scripture. Um, so I think we're just going through the very key important texts of the Bible in regard to this topic. Hey, Nick, I have a real quick question about something you said in passing there. Um, does John Paul II actually use the phrase the Pauline theology of the body or does he talk about the Pauline interpretation? Um, in, uh, in paragraph four, um, the first sentence, he, he, I think he calls it the Pauline theology of the body. He does. Yes, he does. But can anyone, can anyone think of any other scripture text that would be considered very important for a theology of the body? Um, I mean, we've looked at the three words of Christ now, you know, the triptych, and uh, now we're, we're going to go to Ephesians, and we've looked at St. Paul several times. Um, any other texts that, that seem important to you? It seems like there's a lot of texts that have implications here. There's parts of the Bible that they call, um, like the book of Revelation, Genesis, Proverbs. But 
I'm having trouble thinking of other polling things um, that tie directly into this. Maybe polling theology of the temple, um, since he mentions that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and St. Paul talks about that a couple of different places, like in Second Corinthians, and then he talks about temple imagery elsewhere. I think how he reads the Pauline text. You remember that was sort of one of my points earlier that in throughout the New Testament, if you're looking for um, scripture about marriage, it is almost exclusively written by individuals who were never married or not married. And the only person who sort of was married, Peter, in first and second Peter doesn't say much about it at all. <laughs> Unless you um, look at the Song of Songs. Uh, it's a whole book. New Testament. Oh, New Testament, yeah. And I was looking at the um, First Corinthians 15. That's the whole resurrection. The section on the resurrection of, um, of the dead, the resurrection of the body. That's, uh, Did we reflect on that passage in when we were talking about the resurrection of the body? I can't remember. Did, did John Paul II? I'm sorry. Is that... You know what? I don't think he did. Um, maybe that comes later. I don't know. Wait, the sacrament comes next, right? So I don't think he... Oh, he did. He did. He did. Audience number 70. Um, he, he starts that section, 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah. Audience number 70. I don't know if I'm right, but I understand all the passages where Christ heals someone, you know, the person who couldn't walk or the woman who was bleeding or, you know, all the people who healed physically as well as spiritually. I think in a way, theology of the body is implicit there. No, in the way that Jesus is joining this physical health with our spiritual health and in some way telling us that he's healing us physically but also our sins are forgiven and I think in a way he's teaching us that it, it comes together that we are body and soul together I mean it's not explicit but for me that's much of the lesson that I can take from so it's not one passage it's many many passages where he where he heals What was, the question was, what other scriptures, what other scriptures in the New Testament, the theology of the body? Or, or the Old Testament, yeah. So, the whole passion in all of them. Because theology of the body is really about love. And the passion is probably the most powerful um, story of self um, sacrificial love there is. That just made me think Jesus said, this is my body, right? In the Eucharist, in the last supper, and that's connected to the passion. He gave his body. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that. You know, it's really important to always realize like theology of the body is based on scripture, right? It's heavily based on scripture. And um, at the end, I wanted to talk about this one thing. He says that the theology of the body is fundamental. This is in, in point number 10. Um, the, fir the first sentence of point number 10. Uh, what we have customarily defined as theology of the body proves to be something truly fundamental and constitutive for anthropological hermeneutics as a whole, and at the same time equally fundamental for ethics and the theology of human ethos. Mm -hmm. So what, how, how do you take that quote and what does that mean? Theology of the body 
transcends a religious or a religion. Uh, it's born of religion, but it transcends. It, it's the theology of the body provides a definition for the human person. So therefore then the theology of the body is a lens at which you can look at all of creation. And it explains the beauty and the separation from beauty that you experience when you look around the fallen world. So I think my understanding of hermeneutics is understanding what things mean, right? And uh, so all the anthropology that we study at the, at, at the university, academic level, whatever, has no meaning without including the creator and who we are from a trans, transcendent perspective. Who cares if we came from monkeys? I mean, who cares? Unless it was God's plan and there's some meaning for it. Do you see what I mean? So that's what he, when he says, theology of the body, it's, it's sort of like, you know, you can have a lot of knowledge, but if you don't have any wisdom about the knowledge, you can't use it, right? So I think that that's what he's saying about, we can do all the study we want about, you know, man came from this and that or whatever. But if we don't understand the meaning, then we, it doesn't make any sense. And then the other thing was, um, equally fundamental for ethics and for the theology of human ethos. Well, it's the same thing. I mean, you can have all kinds of rules, but if you don't understand how God designed the, designed the creation and how it was supposed to be in the beginning, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know what right from wrong is, you know, if we don't have, understand the mind of God. So that I think what he's kind of saying here is, is that theology is the queen of all science. That you cannot have the full picture of any scientific endeavor without acknowledging the presence of our creator and and that we were that we're creatures and created you know we we don't get the whole picture i think thank you that was great yeah thank you michelle Maybe this sounds too simple, but I'm kind of piggybacking off Michelle, but uh, um, anthropological hermeneutics, it's kind of a, to me, an understanding of who man is. And I hear Bill Donahue saying that all the time, who man is and what our destiny is. Um, and the theology of the, of human ethos is if we understand who we are and what our destiny is, then our ethos will follow, follow that. Yeah, it reminds me of how Michael Waldstein in the introduction talked about how modern science is really just interested in material, but it doesn't take into account our origin and our destiny. And that's something that John Paul II brought up in Faith and Reason, B. Days of Apple, uh, where he talks about these questions on man's heart, like where did I come from and where am I going, that people just long to know. And those are questions that we can only guess at if we don't listen to what God has to say. So God and his revelation that we find here explaining the theology of the body really gives us the answers to the questions so that we can have a, a sure hope about our future and our destiny. I, I take it a little more um, in a narrow fashion in terms of it saying basically it um, as a uh, anthropo anthropological hermeneutic, it will help us interpret all aspects of, 
questions about what it means to be human. And so therefore, he's basically saying, you know, if you're going to talk about feminism, you have to understand it from the um, theology of the body. You're talking about same-sex marriage, you're talking about transgenderism or anything like that. All those questions about what it means to be a human has to be answered out of this fundamental and uh, I can't even say the constitutive, is that how you said it? Yeah. Uh, uh, work, you know, and, and it, it is foundational for both our understanding and our uh, ethics that we take from it. So you guys, I use the word hum hermeneutics a lot when I respond to people on Facebook. <laughs> and they have no idea what they, 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 they get totally stumped. So look it up and use it. <laughs> because what they'll do is, so they'll, so, you know, it's often a person who misinterprets what, um, a political situation or a politician has said or whatever. And I'll say this person, the um, reporter needs a class in hermeneutics. They don't understand the English language. <laughs> so look it up and use it. It's, it's great that people just sort of go, what? <laughs> So you could say that it's like a honest search for truth, Michelle? Hermeneutics, could it be a way to explain what it is? Uh, well, hermeneutics is understanding what it means. So I, that's what it sort of means, right? Now, I think it's a more precise thing. Hermeneutics is your interpreting principle. Mm. And it's the study of inter uh, interpretation. So right. Right, they, exactly. They use it in literature and things like that too. So it, it, it often helps you contextualize and, and then recognize what truth really, really take from something. Right. And it is a fun word, Michelle. <laughs> I've stayed off of Facebook a lot lately, just because it's just so frustrating. And I don't like spending time on Facebook anyway, but, um, but um, theology of the body has lots of cool words that actually you can use. <laughs> Constitutive is a nice word too. Yeah, I need to look that one up. <laughs> I, I, I just did. Have... Yeah. yeah. I, I pronounced it wrong, I think. I think it's constitutive. Well, I just had it pronounced on my phone. Yeah, it says constitutive. I don't know if they're right. It could be a British pronunciation for all I know. <laughs> well, when I first read, started reading um, John Paul II, I had to start writing down what words meant. <laughs> because he has, some of his things have really subtle uh meanings and sometimes they have more meanings than one because you know how he does that circular thing you know he, he defines it in a particular way and then he goes a little bit deeper and he adds the definition and a little bit further and further and so um i want to learn to be good like that but balstein is an extremely intelligent man and when he's interpreting he's interpreting it with the uh, exact theological and uh, philosophical precision that uh, he believes John Paul wanted for all that came. And other two words, I mean, much more simple than the ones you were mentioning, but I, that I want to keep after reading this audience are gift and grace. I love that he kept using these words because we had been uh, you know, debating about if we choose this vocation of, or if we choose the other one and which one is better. And then I read this and I find the gift you receive. So for me, it's much easier to understand my vocation as a gift and not like, oh, did I choose what was best? 
it says that that's the gift that was given to me and we just need to be open to the gift we receive and with the gift comes grace so they are two much simpler words but that i think that give us a lot of light Nick, um, I think it's a, it's a great question to ask what scriptures, um, if I understand your, your question correctly, um, we think are important because it forces us to distill all this down. Uh, I think we can lose sight of the forest or the trees. Um, I got very frustrated about three years ago with the Facebook pages of um, some, you know, some of the posts and stuff that I was seeing, I guess, having been, you know, involved in TOB things, activities and, you know, workshops, study groups and healing um, things. And then to see some of the posts that seemed like it, um, and I don't mean to be critical of the people at all, but it seemed like some of the things that were coming out were, were almost like um, counting the, how many angels could fit on the head of a pin, you know what I mean? Um, I think it's so important to be able to distill it down and to extract what really applies to real human life. And I, I think that the, maybe the, the um, you know, by applying to real human life, we know that the questions, you know, the fundamental questions, what does it mean to be human? And how do you, how does a person live his or her life in a way uh, that brings them true happiness? So, um, I just think it's, um, I just think the pain that I was experiencing in my life um, and the, the pain of people around me who were um, coming up against the, um, the culture, you know, the way it's turned out with dealing with real issues, like really, you know, probably things that the Pope never even dreamed of. Uh, we're going to happen, you know, um, in our time um, was just so overwhelming um, to me that it seemed too out there to, to just keep bringing this up in an abstract way. It just seemed like, you know, well, what you were talking about, Nick, Nick to, um, to get on our knees and just start getting into it from that way. And uh, to just really distill all this down, like Christopher West talked about in his book, um, Build These Hearts, like after 25 years of teaching TLB, it was desire, design, destiny, and get to the heart of the matter. And um, in his book, um, um, can't remember the name of it right now, but um, the heart of the gospel. And the Pope said that um, the scripture, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and it refers to Christ in the church. This is the summa of the gospel. I mean, why? Why is it the similar of the gospel? Well, think about it. You know, why, why is it? And the words naked without shame. Why is this so important? Why is, why is, why is the, the word the gift? You know, it's like, let's, let's get down to the, let's get down to the real nitty gritty of it all because there's, you know, this world is so in need of healing and there's got to be power behind these words. It can't just be talking about it 
in these, you know, philosophical, in this, you know, way out their language. It has to be to help people to understand who they are. You are my beloved in whom I am well pleased. These words to Jesus at his baptism, our identity is in Christ. Otherwise we feel like we're just a piece of dirt. No, when we were baptized, we were baptized into Christ. And this is how we're gonna get healed. These are all so important, all these concepts. And if we don't get it down and into our hearts, nobody, these words just in this book are gonna be nothing. It's just because I, I look at these words and I get some of the concepts of that are that are written in here doesn't mean they're going to help anyone they they've got to be it's got to be the power the power in the words the power of scripture and the pope says that do not rob the the cross of its power so that's all i got to say i'm trying to get the angels off the head <laughs> <laughs> when we had the, the angels are jesus angels yeah. so we need the power to send his angels to free people so that's all i got to say so along along those lines um maybe a saint that would help with that mary would be uh edith stein um the, a woman of unbelievably extraordinary intelligence. She had all the head knowledge. She was at the top of her psychological time. And she chose to go into a Carmelite monastery to pray. And she believed in her prayer that God was calling her to make a sacrifice. And she said, more than once that she believed that you know she tried to argue with people about how wrong they were to become you know followers of Hitler and become Nazis and she tried to dissuade them she tried to change their minds and she came to the conclusion that you know I think God is calling me to my own holocaust mm -hmm. That's going to speak a lot louder than any words I can say. So um, as far as a saint who can help us with having a tremendous gift of the mind, but actually giving over her own body because of her heart. Mm. Sure, Bob. Thank you. Yeah, it's so important. Thank you. I know we're running, running over time. Uh, thank you. You all so much for your work. It's it really great, sort of at the end of part one, sort of have a, a summary, a summary to think back. Where have we been? What have we gone through? Um, what have we covered so far? Because now we're we're going to be moving on. We have one more audience, and we're moving on to the next topic. So um, it's good to reflect a little bit about where we've been. What do all these truths mean? And really allow them to go from our head through that longest journey to our heart. And that's what I think the Theology of the Body Institute does so well at in uh, teaching how these truths affect the heart, how they affect our lives. And it's not only an academic study, which it is academic in nature, and there's a lot of truth there. And that's why we're going through one by one, because this writing of the Pope is so dense, so rich, uh, that there's so much there that it, it really takes a lifetime to unpack. Um, so... Uh, thank you all for, for going through it. And I know it's, it bears fruit. It takes a lot of time and effort. Um, but I know I've learned a lot from you all just, just having discussions. And I think these discussions will continue and we can keep going deeper and growing. Uh, but most of all, how they apply to our lives. Because, yeah, it, it is not meant to be abstract. You know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, and we're called to live out these truths. But yeah. Any other thoughts? Good to see you, Pi. Hi. <laughs> um, we can end in in prayer. Would Would someone like to close us in prayer tonight? I will close us in prayer. Thanks, Amos.
Let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God, our Father, you are gracious, you are merciful, you are tender, and you are powerful. We thank you for your great majesty. We thank you that we've been created in your image and likeness so that this material world might have some glimpse of you. We thank you for our destiny that even when it was lost through the sin of our first parents, has been restored and redeemed by your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've created us for this purpose and filled our hearts with hope, the hope of being fully alive, fully human, fully healed as we draw closer to Christ. So help us to delve deeper into the mystery of our own body, the mystery of our origin and our destiny, the mystery of what you're calling us to be in this life, and help us to treasure the gift of our humanity, of our redemption, of our vocation, of all the ways that you have blessed us and filled us with grace. Let us not take that for granted. Help us to keep our hearts fixed on doing your will so that whether we are married or widowed or single, whatever state we find our in, our heart's desire may be in pleasing you, Lord. And here we turn uh, seeking the intercession of our mother, our mother, uh, our Lady of Guadalupe, as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Paul II, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Pray for us. St. Edith Stein, pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.